Hey everybody, welcome back. We are on Unit 4, the financial sector, and we are on banking and the expansion of the money supply. So in this video, we're going to see how the money supply expands, and you're going to see that the banking system is very important for the money supply to expand, all right? So let's get after it. I've got this little visual up here. I've got Joe Public. I want you to think of Joe Public right now having $1,000 in currency in his hand that is currency in circulation so that thousand dollars is part of the money supply but he's about to deposit it into bank one which is of course part of the banking system as is banking two and any other banks okay so we've got this setup going on just to remind you of a few things the money supply guys is m1 okay m1 that aggregate measurement of the money supply it includes currency, currency in circulation and demand deposits. So we're going to want to keep our eye on both of these to see when the money supply actually expands and when it doesn't. Okay? So let's take a look at this. Joe makes a deposit into Bank One. Now before I record this deposit, I want to go over a few things. Assets, what are they? These are things that we own or are owed to us. So Bank One assets are things Bank One owns or, are, or things that are owed to Bank One. Liabilities, that's our debt, that's what we owe to others. All right, now, again, Joe makes the positive $1,000. I also have to clarify something else as we do this. So I've got this little $1 right here. Imagine I've got 1,000 of these. 1,000 of these in Joe's hand are absolutely part of the money supply, okay? However, when he makes a deposit and puts these into a bank, when these pieces of paper go into a bank, they cease to be money. Why were they money in Joe's hand? Because again, they were currency in circulation, i.e. E. Joe could use these pieces of paper to go buy goods and services for himself. When these pieces of paper go into Bank One, Bank One cannot use these pieces of paper to go buy goods and services. In other words, Bank One, say they wanted a new sofa for their lobby, they could not use Joe's deposit of these pieces of paper to go buy that sofa. They are forbidden from doing that. So, these pieces of paper in Joe's hand, currency and circulation, when they head into a bank, they become what we call bank reserves, okay? So when they go into the bank, they're bank reserves. So we're finally ready to record this transaction. He makes a deposit of 1,000. Bank One takes ownership of those pieces of paper, so their reserves go up by $1,000. Their reserves go up by $1,000. They are taking ownership of those pieces of paper, and again, those pieces of paper inside the bank are known as reserves. But of course, Joe is getting his checking account credited, okay? And that's something Bank One owes to Joe. So, and by the way, demand deposits is the term for checking accounts, all right? So demand deposit, Joe, this is his checking account, it's going to get credited $1,000. So there's a little double entry accounting which is necessary when we record transaction. Bank One's getting the reserves, however, they have to take on a liability to get those reserves. Did the money supply change from the deposit? The answer is no. Why is that? Well. The money supply, again, is currency of circulation and demand deposits. I'm going to call, call this deposit T1 for transaction 1. In fact, let me go put a T1 right here, too. Transaction 1 is the deposit. Currency in circulation went down by $1,000. Demand deposits went up by $1,000. The money supply did not change from the deposit. Think about it this way. Joe, he used to be able to buy $1,000 of goods and services with that currency. After the deposit, he can still buy $1,000. He doesn't have the currency, but he's now got money in his checking account. He can still buy $1,000 of goods and services. And as we said, Bank One can't buy any goods and services with this deposit. However, what can Bank One do with this deposit? They can make a loan. Now, before we go any further, i got to introduce the required reserve ratio. I'm going to say it's 10%. What is the required reserve ratio? It is the percent of a bank's demand deposit, it must hold as reserve. It cannot lend out, that means. Okay, let me say that again. The required reserve ratio is the percent of a bank's demand deposit it must hold in reserve. So it got $1,000 in demand deposit, it must hold on to $100 of that $1,000. But 
That means the other 900 is excess reserves. They can loan out that other 900. That's right. They can't buy goods and services with reserves, but they can loan out reserves, all right? So let's just say that Ed walks into bank one and Ed needs a loan. He says, I need a loan for $900. So we go to bank one's balance sheet, and I'm going to write the loan on the asset side. Loan Ed. Why is that an asset to bank one? Because this is something that Ed is now going to owe bank one plus $900, right? Ed is taking out a loan for $900. We're saying that bank one's going to loan out the maximum they can from the deposit, which is $900. They can't loan out $1,000 because of this required reserve ratio, which, by the way, is set by the Fed. Okay, and the Fed is a regulatory agency. Okay, it regulates banks, so it's going to make sure they don't lend out more than ninety percent. Now, Ed, he's going to get something. We're going to see this double entry accounting again for this transaction. Two, T two is the loan. Ed is going to get his checking account credited, or if he didn't have a checking account with Bank One, Bank One's going to create a checking account and is going to put in it. Remember, the man deposit his checking account. Ed, uh, sorry, $900. Now, something very big just happened, all right? In this T2 right there, money just got created, all right? Loans create money. What do I mean by that? Well, remember, at the beginning of this whole thing, how many goods and services could be bought? 1,000 with that currency that Joe had. At this point, after the loan, how many goods and services can be bought? Well, Joe can still buy 1,000, and now Ed can buy 900. So the money supply has gone up by 900. It's gone from 1,000 to 900. In fact, let me go record it here. In T2, nothing happened to currency in circulation. However, demand deposits went up by 900. Hey, T2, which was the loan, that created money. We can now buy more goods and services because, the, because a loan was made. So one more time, loans create money. Super important for us to get that. Now, as we close out this part one video, part two we'll see we're going to use bank two, but as we close out this part one video, I know a few of you guys might be a little bit confused. You might be like, wait a second. Um, if Joe tries to go buy goods and services and Ed tries to buy uh, goods and services, if they both spend all the money in their checking account, then isn't Bank One going to go under? And it's a good question, but guys, we need to understand that Bank One has a lot more depositors than just two, right? This is a stylized example. When you think of banks out there having hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in deposit, and holding on to 10% at least, and sometimes more than that in reserve, they will be fine when people spend money. So keep that in mind. Big key again, money just the money supply just expanded. It expanded through a loan, and we're gonna see that we're gonna get even more expansion from this initial deposit in part two. Hope that made sense to you. We'll see you in the next video.